She is. Okay. I was like, she found a better offer. She left. <laughs> uh, so yesterday I was talking to my mom and she told me something I never knew. And uh, she said back in the early 80s, her and my dad were asked to teach a, tr a, a class at their church. And I just died laughing at the title of this class. So back in the day, my parents were asked to teach in church the class entitled God, the Rod, and Your Child's Bod. <laughs> and I love that. I'm like, we need to bring some of those classes back, Darla. That's awesome. So rest assured, our children are well spanked. <laughs> we come from a long line of spankers. And uh, I can attest to the fact my parents were well certified in the God the Rod and your child bod classes. So uh, I guess we have, yeah, everyone needs a heritage. So we got some spanking in our heritage, which is good to know. Both sides of the family tree were very well versed in that. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're just finding your uh, notes get settled, Brand's going to pull up a picture here. This, I like to open up every lecture with a picture of my people. Um, these are not all of my people. I have four children. Um, if I've never met you before, my name is Cherie Finney. Uh, this picture is at my mother-in-law's house. She had a sleepover over the weekend. I think there's 10, 10 kids she had sleeping in her living room floor. So, um, so my four people are, are in there. Um, but I like to show a picture of what my people do when I'm hitting the books and studying. And so thank you, Darla, for taking my people off my hands. So appreciate that. Um, we're going to open with prayer and then we're going to get started into lecture. So if you don't have notes, lift your hand. Debbie is going around with notes and she'll hook you up. So, all right, let's get started with prayer. Oh, Father God, I thank you for the privilege to be in uh, your house, to be in a church, to come together with fellow women who are believers in you. I thank you that we live in a country that allows us the freedom and the opportunity to come together in a safe place and space to um, talk about your word. I thank you for uh, the tremendous growth um, that you have uh, done in my own life uh, through your word and thank you for people like linda mitchum who have shown me how to study scripture um help me when i've felt like quitting when it's hard and difficult um to just keep uh keep going with it lord so open um our eyes right now help us to see our savior afresh today and god i just pray that you would help us to see the beauty and the wonder that is found within your word so thank you for hearing our prayers thank you for being present in our lives and um, for all you do, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so show of hands, as you were reading through your lesson in Matthew 1, how many of you just skipped right through the whole genealogy and went to verse 18? I, I'm right there with you. We have the saints on this side. Okay, in the group they did it. We got the saints over here that read through every word. Good job. I did not want to read Matthew 1 verses 1 through 17 in front of you because I know you'd be critiquing is that a long e or a short e did she pronounce it correctly probably not okay I don't get paid for doing this so that's what you get okay um so anyways I I want to actually ironically look at the significance of the genealogy of Jesus though um I didn't get very far um in in my studies other than an we're going to go with the first verse of Matthew chapter one, verse one. So it's at the top of your notes. Um, today, for our purposes together, we're going to actually only focus on one person very closely that's mentioned in Jesus's genealogy. So Matthew chapter one, verse one, we do see two people mentioned here. The verse reads the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So that first intro verse, we have two names mentioned besides the Messiah. They are David and Abraham. Good job. Um, today we're going to look at, in our first part of our lecture notes, the importance of Jesus's ancestry. 
Um, do you gals need notes coming in? Because there was, okay, perfect. You're all hooked up. Okay. Um, last week, Linda did a fantastic job talking about the kingdom. Um, that's a, a very central idea that we see in the book of Matthew. Um, today, we're looking at every kingdom has a king. And in this lecture today, we're going to be looking at the king's ancestry. So we're specifically looking at Jesus's ancestry and why it matters. Um, Christ is king in the gospel of Matthew is a central theme. So get familiar with that. Um, just be ready for that kind of language throughout our study of the book of Matthew. Um, your first uh, fill in the blanks there. I want to read a quote I found from my commentary. So this is from the John Phillips commentary on the gospel of Matthew. And um, we're going to get you your blanks here. Brandy does all the things. So she's trying to be in two places at once. Um, so looking at this quote here, the gospel of Matthew presents Christ as king. That's your first blank. It was written by a Jew primarily for the Jewish people whose great hope, those are your next two blanks, was the coming of a promised Messiah. So I present to you that the gospel of Matthew here is presenting Christ as king. The gospel of Matthew is written by a Jew, primarily for a Jewish audience or Jewish people, whose great hope was the coming of a promised Messiah. So it makes sense why this book of Matthew opens up with the genealogy of Jesus, the genealogy of the Messiah, why it's important. Uh, point number one below that quote there. The king's ancestry is recorded in Matthew 1, 1 through 17, which we talked about. All the names we don't want to, you know, even try and tackle. Um, in that, we have Abraham also listed, which I read from verse 1. Uh, why is Abraham listed? Because he was the father of the covenant people. Back in Genesis 12, God makes this covenant with Abraham, saying all the peoples, uh, all nations will be blessed through your offspring. So there's that covenant made. Thus, it was important for Matthew to bring up Christ descended from the line of Abraham, also from the line of David. We're not looking at Abraham today. We're going to look and specifically focus on Christ coming and descending from David. Um, I love this quote so much. This was worth the price of this cultural study Bible. Um, so I, I just totally took it out of my footnotes. The cultural background study Bible said this. Here's the, here's the key thing I loved. Jesus is so pivotal, that's your blank, for Israel's history, that even his ancestors depend on him for their purpose and meaning. So think about that and listen to that again. Jesus is so pivotal for Israel's history that even his ancestors depend on him for their purpose and meaning. Usually it's the other way around, um, which I, I loved that quote. So even Messiah's ancestors their whole function and purpose is to point to the Messiah. I just love that, that significance there. Um, so we know that uh, between Malachi and Matthew, between the Old and the New Testament, we have this 400 years of silence. And we're all familiar with that. You know, okay, God has not spoken um, since the time of Malachi. There's a 400-year period of time um, of silence and waiting. So the question I loved reading this in one of my other um, footnotes. The people had to be wondering, now what has happened to the royal line, that's your next blank, of David? In that 400-year period, what has happened to this royal line? Well, here we have Matthew on the scene accounting for the generations, the 14 generations, the 14 generations, the 14 generations, following the line of David down. But the people had to surely be asking, what has happened to the royal line of David? So we know that Jesus is, the, is from the line of David, according to Matthew 1. It, it indicates that there, the top of your notes, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We also know, according to scripture, um, in Luke 2, 4, 
I'll read that to you. I'm going to be jumping around a lot today. If you want to jot the references down, go for it. If you beat me there, good job. Sometimes I cheat and I have post-it notes, so I'll get there really freaky fast. Um, but if you want to just jot down the references today, we're going to be jumping around a ton. So we're talking about now that royal line of David, and we know that Jesus is of the royal line. So jot down Luke 2, 4 in the sides of your notes just to refer back to later if you'd like. So Luke 2, 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. So we're getting familiar with that, the line of David here. Okay, so, so keep that in your mind. Revelation 22, 16 is another reference to just jot down. Um, we see in red letters in Revelation 22, 16, says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So in Revelation 22, 16, in red letters, we see Jesus saying, I am the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So we're actually now just following that royal line of David down to Messiah. And it's authenticated and uh, reiterated in scripture by Christ in his own words in Revelation there. So point number three, the Davidic line was established by God as a covenant forever. The Davidic line was established by God as a covenant forever. Your notes has uh, the reference there, 2 Samuel 7. I'm going to read that to you. Um, the importance of the Old Testament passages to authenticate who Christ claimed to be is super important. So to a Jew, this would be very significant, seeing that Christ fulfilled the prophecies that were made, um, that Christ fulfilled that, yes, Messiah must come through the line of David, that we see in 2 Samuel 7, um, verses 12 through 16, that this, this Davidic line, this Davidic covenant was a covenant forever. So let's read that together. So 2 Samuel 7, uh, verses 12 through 16. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So seeing that, that connection that your house and your kingdom to David shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So if you look in the Old Testament, Daniel 7 echoes this, talks about an everlasting dominion. We know that was prophesied that Christ's dominion will be an everlasting dominion. But the point being, God will fulfill, that's your next blank, his promise to David. God has so interwoven this throughout all of scripture that we just have to look and see account after account after instance after instance of where God says, I will establish this throne forever. Uh, this will be an everlasting dominion from beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation. We see this to be true that Messiah comes through this Davidic line by God's ordaining. Your star there, because I get tired of doing numbers, so I like to change it up and put little cool things. So your first star there is don't miss the fact that Jesus is a bridge from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So if you were a casual reader of the Bible and you just got a Bible, uh, you had no biblical background whatsoever, you're reading through this very confusing Old Testament if you don't have the Holy Spirit to help you. Even when I have this help, I'm still confused at times. Um, but you're reading through this and you're like, now I get to this second half of scripture, the New Testament, and it goes into like this long list of 
dead people. And, and, and it's so confusing, but you don't want to miss the fact that the Old Testament into the New Testament, Jesus is bridging that gap there of what's happening. So this old covenant has occurred, and now the new covenant is here. The New Testament is going to talk about this coming Messiah, about his birth. We have an old covenant, and now we're going into a new covenant. So Christ is so central to the Bible. I think sometimes we just read it like any other book, and we miss the significance and the transitions we have in Scripture. They're there for a specific reason. Um, next star, someone else said this way smarter than I, and I don't know who it was, so I can't give him credit, but someone else said, his birth is so significant. Jesus' birth is so significant. It divides earth's history before him and after him. Such a significant birth that one person to be born, and we mark all of the years at this birth, at this time, and, and, and everything forever past is marked by that one event of Christ's birth. I love that. It's like such a significant moment in history that even the secular world goes by that calendar. You know, we have before Christ and we have after him. So I love that. Um, I'm just a stealer, apparently. I stole Alistair Begg's uh, quotes here. Um, so this is Alistair Begg's quote. As we read through scripture, we see that in the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted. I'll give you a moment to write that down. As we work our way from the Old Testament in Scripture, we come to the Gospels. And in the Gospels, we see that Jesus is revealed. Is your next fill in the blank. In the book of Acts, we see that Jesus is preached. In the epistles or those letters, we see that Jesus is explained. And in the book of Revelations, we see that Jesus is expected. Behold, he is coming again. You don't want to lose sight of Jesus as you're in scripture. As you navigate your way through the Bible, always seeing where is um Where's Christ in this story? Why is this story here? What's the point of this? Perhaps it's to show um, God's remnant for his people, that his Messiah will come. God will be faithful to his word. But we can see Christ literally throughout the whole Old Testament. I mean, we'll be studying sometimes in our group, and we're talking about the high priest like we did today, seeing that Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of this Old Testament high priest we read about, well, now we see that Christ fulfills all of that perfectly. So we'll see in the Old Testament at times where uh, Moses could be like a type of Christ, where he's this uh, deliverer of the people. And we see that, okay, Christ ultimately delivered his people from sin. Um, what Moses got wrong, Christ fulfilled and did um, beautifully and perfectly. So don't miss Christ as you navigate your way through the Bible. Um, in Mark 1, 14 through 15, Jesus' own words speaking here in your blank will be, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So essentially Christ comes on the scene and he's saying, you have waited, your ancestors have waited. The one has been prophesied, the anointed one, capital O. The time is fulfilled. Now the kingdom of God is at hand. So they, these, these people in the New Testament are missing it. They're not all seeing that God's chosen one is right in front of their face. They're interacting with him. We know that Christ had to come at a specific point in time in history. Um, I've heard it asked, like, well, why didn't Christ come at other times? Why didn't Christ come nowadays where we could have uh, recordings of him and we could have, you know, physical evidence and whatnot? Well, we know that Christ had to come before the destruction of the temple, which was in 70 AD. So there's specific times when Christ actually came and was prophesied to come at the exact moment that he did come. We know that in scripture, we'll get into it next week in our lesson, but that God used a, a census by Caesar Augustus. So God's using this uh, this ruler to put out a census that just so happens to bring Mary to the town of Bethlehem for the Savior to be born, where it was prophesied hundreds of years ago. 
God was just like the exact time of her birth shall occur as the census takes place and Joseph returns to his town. Um, it's just amazing. It boggles my mind. The intricacies of scripture and the prophecies fulfilled. Continuing on in our notes. Um, yes, you see that your promised Messiah is here. So if we remembered that God would be faithful to his word, he would be faithful to the, to the Davidic covenant that the Messiah would come. Part two, we're going to look today at the connections between Jesus and David. Did you know in the book of Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus and David are tied together nine different times. So on nine different occasions, there's interactions of connections between Jesus and David. And today we're only going to look at about seven. Um, I don't know why I didn't do all nine. I guess I'm lazy. Um, but your first little arrow there, I was... Uh, I liked what Mike Winger pointed out. He says in Matthew 1, 6, it's interesting that David is, call, or David is called David the king. So if I read to you Matthew 1, 6, it says, um, Jesse was the father of David the king. Stay with me here. Mike Winger points out, David's called David the king in Matthew 1, 6. But he, he points out there are no other kings listed there are other kings listed in the genealogy of Jesus, excuse me, but they're not given that exact label or title of king in Matthew 1. So David's the only one that says David the king. Did you notice that in the genealogy of Jesus? I didn't notice that until someone smarter pointed it out. For example, Solomon is in the genealogy, but it doesn't say Solomon the king. It says Solomon. And I thought that's interesting. The, the author here is bringing our attention to David the king specifically because we're looking at Christ the King, this Messiah that's here, and his ancestry. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I'm going to read to you Micah 5, 1 through 5. Um, prophesied here through the prophet Micah. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops, they have laid siege against us with a rod. They will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. Verse 2, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one, capital O, will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. So if I read that to you and it sounded like some weird old ancient riddle, Let's break it down together. So what do we see here? Point A, we see prophesied in Micah that Bethlehem will be the birthplace of the future Messianic king. So Micah is prophesying hundreds of years in advance that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Point B, who else do we know that was born in Bethlehem? Bethlehem is also the birthplace of David. It's also referred to as the city of David. Luke 2.11, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. Luke 1.69, you can jot that reference down. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Point C in John 7, 42, and this is the verse, and we're just filling in the blanks of John 7, 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Looking again at our next reference of the connections of Jesus and David in the book of Matthew, we jump over to Matthew 2, 6, and I put the verse in your notes. It says, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, 
for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What was David in his early years, guys? A shepherd. That's your next blank. You can jot down Psalms 78, verses 70 and 71, and I'll read them to you. Everyone doing okay? All right. I guess if you're not, you wouldn't say no. So we're looking at David as shepherd. So Psalms 78, verses 70 and 71. And he, he also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. So we see David coming from the sheepfolds. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So in scripture, as we look at scripture, who does Jesus claim to be when we look at John 10, 14 through 16? Is it by coincidence that Jesus says this in John 10? 14 through 16. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. So we see the connection of David as shepherd in his early years, and Jesus is known to us as the good shepherd. One flock, one shepherd. Um, that was also prophesied in Ezekiel 34, 23. I encourage you to go back and read those passages in Ezekiel if you get a chance. The prophecy of one shepherd coming to shepherd over Israel is prophesied in Ezekiel. Point E Son of David is a messianic kingly title. Matthew 9, 27, where two blind men cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. When they say son of David, that is a messianic kingly title they were giving. Even the blind could see who this one was. This one was the promised shepherd the promised messiah that was to come and the blind men literally cry out in, in matthew 9 27 have mercy on us son of david that was a messianic kingly title that was um known to to the jews letter f in matthew 12 23 we're looking again at connections between jesus and david they ask could this be the son of david so whenever there's a talk of messiah the son of David is very synonymous with this. G, what do they cry out um, in this triumphal entry? Hosanna to the son of David in Matthew 21, 9. Hosanna is a Hebrew expression meaning save, exclamation. Hosanna there where they cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. It was a cry for deliverance. And that's your blank. So they're literally saying salvation has come, save us, deliver us, because they know the Redeemer has come. Point H in Matthew 22, 41 through 46, there's this encounter and they're asking, whose son is he? What do we do about Jesus here? And the response of the people is the son of David. It's very interesting. Well, surely the Messiah, the son of David. Okay, let's keep going. Although we're looking at Christ as king in scripture, it's very easy to detach ourselves from the application of that in our own lives. And I wanted us to think about for a moment, ask ourselves, what rules you right now? Who is your king? Most people would say, well, Jesus is. But who do you cry out to for deliverance? What do you cry out to for deliverance? For some people, it might be food, family, fear, money, looks, health, career, success, job. But ask yourself, what rules me right now? What is king over me right now? At times in my own life, it's been me, little K, pretty poor king. Um, 
But I want us to remember that Christ is a sovereign king. He will not share his throne with anyone. When you're sovereign, it means you're it. You're over all. You are the king of kings. So if you are the king, you reign. As we look at the book of Matthew throughout our weeks and months going into this study, consider that our king, what he's telling us in the text, every time we hear him speak, what is he telling us about himself, about, about ourselves? We know that a king will not share his throne. We know that Jesus is king. I love when I look back, um, I love going through the gospels and our, and our next lesson, Linda, as she wrote the lesson, has us going to Luke and, and we're looking at other references of, of Jesus' birth. Um, but I love the fact, and I was just thinking about when the Magi encountered Christ as a child, when they come to him to bring him the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, I love the fact that when they encountered him, they fell to the ground and worshiped him. I love that. How, how many of you have ever been to a baby shower? People just came and fell to the ground and worshiped. But no, I ain't never been to a baby shower where they brought gold, okay? But that was a, a gift for a king. And even the Magi, this secular group, whoever they were, these uh, magicians or whatever they were, they came and they bowed down and they worshiped the child. It was the only response you could have for a king. It wasn't even king over them necessarily. Say, we don't know where they're from, but say they came from the east. Say it was something like Persia. I'm just saying. Okay, well, they would have their own Persian king, let's say. But these people travel from the east in search of the king, literally drawing out those that weren't even of the messianic heritage here of the of the covenant people, the nation of Israel, because they had to come and worship the king. I love that. Reminds me of Philippians 2.10. It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. The only response to our king is to worship and to bow down and to submit to his reign. Revelation 19.16 is your last reference I put in your notes. And I love the fact that scripture declares in Revelation 19.16, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I just love that. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, that is something to be extremely uh, humbled by. So let's close in prayer. God, I just thank you so much for every woman that's here today that has eagerly come to hear truth, Lord. I pray that at times when we're confused and we're um, weary in our study of scripture, God, that you would open our eyes, give us spiritual understanding, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you help us understand and apply scripture to our lives to be transformed by it, Lord to not just have knowledge of you, Lord, but to, to live in wonder and worship and, and reverence of you, God. Um, may you just open our eyes to see you truly as king as we study the book of Matthew. We thank you for this time and thank you for the beautiful, gorgeous, sunshine day. In Jesus' name, amen.